On today's show, we're talking about how the cost of marketing is up 108% in 10 years. That is going to cripple many, many businesses, but it's not if you do one thing. And that's what we're going to talk about with you today. I'm your co-host, Kip Bodner, CMO at HubSpot. I'm joined by my co-host, Kieran Flanagan, who's the CMO at Zapier. This is Marketing Against the Grain. Let's get into today's show. Here, we're starting off with a bummer on today's show. We got some hot data from a friend of the pod that we want to walk through because it's, it's, it's a little scary. Break down for everybody watching what's happening uh, with some hot off the presses data from our friend, Patrick. Right, Patrick Campbell, been on the show many times, an incredible purveyor uh, of data. So he had a really good tweet where he talked about the cost to acquire a customer is going up 108%. So for all of these companies and all of us trying to acquire company customers and grow businesses, that cost has gone up 180%. That's an incredibly high cost, right? Because the cost of products in a competitive landscape continues to try to get pulled down. Like people try to compete on pricing. So what do you do when your business costs to acquire a customer continue to go up and the cost to charge a customer for these products continue to be pulled down because of competition? There's a reason that this is happening. And I've made this point before. Since 2016, there has been a growth in the number of people who do marketing by a hundred and something percent. I can't remember the exact number, but it's a hundred and something percent. The number of marketing channels has grown zero. Actually, you could argue it has <laughs> decreased because the number of social platforms that now allow you to promote things and kind of redirect people to your site has completely gone down. Everyone's creating a closed wall. Google itself on its search engine, trying to create a closed wall, trying to keep you on their site. So like pretty hard out there for a marketeer. And it is a hard time to grow a customer acquisition engine to actually be able to acquire customers at scale and also profitably. The thing that we always hold ourselves accountable to or good marketers hold themselves accountable to is L to feed a cost. How much does it cost me to acquire this customer? And how much do I earn back from that customer? And we are gonna talk about what is the solution to this? Like, should all marketers and founders and everybody who's reliant on growing the number of customers you have, which is like every business, should we all just give up, pack our bags, go home? Actually, it would be cool if most people did because then we could just have all the channels <laughs> to ourselves. But I think there's another thing that you and I are passionate about. So why don't we kind of tell the listeners a little bit about the future, a little bit about why we think there's a certain trend that will be accelerated because of this. Well, and the reason we, we're going to talk about the future is because it's not just it's gotten bad, it's that it's continuing to get bad. Like if you look right. at Patrick's tweet, right? It's like, oh, the trend of this data is that it's going to keep getting worse, not keep getting better, right? And so you're going to kill your margins as a business. And then subsequently, you're going to end up having to slash your marketing investments if you're invested in the wrong types of marketing, right? In a world where, where co cost of customer acquisition is up, 108%, you have to be very, very disciplined on the type of marketing that you're doing. And we want to talk to you a little bit in the future about what you've got to do. And, and Kieran, I think that it's all about something you and I have spent a lot of time doing, studying, practicing, and that is you've go you're going to have to invest more in very focused B2B creators. We're talking to the B2B folks, but if you're a consumer, creators work for you too. We're talking about creators. Before we even get into that, Kiri, can you break down like, what do we mean? What, 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 what is a creator? What do they do? What, what is the strategy that actually is going to help people grow their businesses? What we have always been passionate about is being able to like grow our own audience. Even though we work at companies, I think you and I have valued having an audience of our own. I know you started your mm -hmm. career and were, you were writing the books on social media before you ever at, kind of got placed in HubSpot or went to HubSpot. I was building not doing as something as good as that. I was building affiliate sites to earn money. But what was I learning about? I was learning about how to like build something within a niche, acquire an audience and monetize that audience. One of my favorite sites that I ever built that I, I sold for uh, some money was like this fashion site. And I could see there was a gap in like how people wanted to buy trainers at the time, sneakers, but they wanted to figure out how they... I love that you call them trainers. It's it's so yes. cute and average <laughs> of you. But they, what, what, I, what I really discovered was like people want to try their trainers on with certain trousers. 
mm-hmm. you call pants for some reason, weird reason. Yeah, you, um, I, I give I give you this. Trousers are a way better word than pants. Pants just oh, are they like, are a way better word. This is one of the American it, words. That pants does not sounds work. like pants. so demoralizing. Trousers sound so like proper and nice. <laughs> pants sounds like you've had a really like hard night out. You wake up in the morning <laughs> uh, in just in a disheveled shape, and you're like got a pair of pants on. Yeah, you like you like sneakers, right? You're I, you I, are. I, I love sne- I love sneakers. I think I think we're gonna be wearing some good sneakers together next week. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun gonna be next week doing this live. You know that the thing that truly like changes how you feel about your sneaker is the is is the try like the trouser you wear, whether it's a Correct. tight fit, long fit, whatever it may be, it, it really changes. So I basically started this site that modeled shoes with different types of trousers. Done really well, sold it. Really, really good. And so, but even ever since I got into marketing and you got into marketing, we've created content, we've tried to cultivate an audience. There's people better than us, but we're pretty good at it for people who work within the company. And I, we started to see this trend continue, right? We start to see founders with strong points of view, with strong social followings, with strong followings online. So why is all this happening? Why do we think that B2B creators are going to be a critical part of the ecosystem going forward? I think there's like three core reasons. It's because the channels that we have relied on as brands are being heavily disrupted and will continue to be heavily disrupted via AI and actually disrupted to the point where it is a real advantage for creators and a disadvantage for brands. So the first one we can talk about maybe is paid advertising, right? That 108% cost going up where you have channels being saturated is because you have an influx of capital of all these new businesses starting into the same amount of channels. And paid is one of the ones that struggles with that the most because your costs just get inflated. And the mm-hmm. other thing I'll add is like AI actually reduces your ability to compete unpaid down to just one thing, which is budget, right? Just, I'm going to optimize the ads. I'm going to create the creative. I'm going to pick your audience. I'm going to do all of those things better than you. But over time, the only thing you'll be able to compete on is budget. Well, hold on, hold on. I, I, there's an important part I want to make around paid marketing because a lot of the increase in marketing costs is coming from increased paid marketing expense, right? And for folks who may be less familiar, most paid models work on an auction model which means the less competition, the less you pay. The more competition, the more you pay, right? Would you agree with that, Karen? Like, is that the the right simplistic statement of that? That is how it works. Okay, what has happened over the last decade as those costs have gone up is that the cost to start a business have gone dramatically down, right? It is easier than ever to incorporate, have software to run your business, have logistics, Mm. hire people, all of the things to build a business have gotten way better, like 10 times better, 10 times easier, 10 times cheaper. So that's been really great for consumers because there's been more choice out in the world. And that is fantastic. But it sucks for marketers. And it sucks for marketers because that means that there's now more competition. And when there's more competition, your advertising prices go up. And so when we're talking about a creator-led strategy and we're talking about reducing your marketing costs, one cheat sheet is, is a marketing strategy that has is lower in competition, where you are doing things that your competitors aren't. And this, this is very counterintuitive, right? If you're a marketer out there, you've always, you've talked to a CEO and it's like, well, what are our competitors doing? Well, why are we doing that if our competitors aren't doing that? If that is the mindset, you're going to fail. Your business is going to fail. Like, cut this clip out, go show it to your CEO. If you are doing what your competitors are doing, you are paying overinflated prices, your cost of customer acquisition is going to go up and your margins are going to go down. If you're willing to take a little right. risk and deviate from what your competitors are doing, then you can be successful. Your co- cost of customer acquisition can go down and your margins will go up. And that is like the most simplistic way I can frame it for everybody out there. Okay, so I think that you are touching on something that this is where we want to get into the original thinker. I just want to round that the point on, on why brand really quickly. We've talked about it before, paid advertising, getting commoditized, the blue links going away in favor of AI chat uh, search. And that actually is h- hard for marketers because it's hard to know how to get your brand in there and actually skews towards established brands, social platforms, closed world gardens, trying to pay creators to actually create content on the platform favors creators, not brands. The thing that you are talking about, which I really agree in, right? Okay, so like you're listening to this, you're like, okay, what do you mean by a B2B creator? And how do I even be a B2B creator? And like, how do I cultivate B2B creators within my brand? Because I truly believe in the future, 
a brand is really just going to be made up of the creators who work inside it for B2B and B2C. There are three categories of creators. And the one that you were talking about is the one I would love to spend some time on. There's the lazy creator, right? The lazy creator <laughs> is like the person, there is nothing wrong with being a lazy creator. We all start at lazy creators where we see something, we all want to get good at it. And we just kind of like put out some things. We haven't really thought through it. We don't know about the angle, the hook. We don't know how it's differentiated. We don't know how it really resonates with someone. And so we just kind of throw it out there, hope it sticks. Then we have the copy and paste creator. I think that's a great way to learn. Like there's a well-known a formula to learn copywriting where you just kind of write out great copy. I used to do it where you just write out great copy. And over time, you train your brain to do that. Sam Parr, who is friend of the show, My First Million, he actually has a whole course where he teaches that. And there's nothing wrong with being a copy and paste creator. And then you have the original thinkers. These are like the top echelon and everyone's copying from them. And I think what you and I have talked about is like AI smokes the lazy creators, totally smokes them because totally it can do a much better them. job than them. It expands the copy and creator bucket quadrant, right? Gets much, much bigger. But the original thinkers are still up there and they're like, castles, right? Owning the owning the internet. And I think for B2C, we've seen a huge shift for these people launching VC companies, launching products, going to do boxing, taking over like the fight game. And I think we're going to see the same B2B and we're going to see these kind of creators emerge and we have some of them in B2B. But how do you be that original thinker, right? Like to your point, all of the things you said sound super easy, but are so hard to do because that's why only really 10%, maybe 15, 20% max, I probably even less, but all B2B marketers can actually be considered in that creator bucket. How do you get in that creator bucket? Like, what do you think? How would we teach someone to, to do that? Yeah. So first of all, even the original thinker bucket that you're going over, they really aren't original thinkers. Like I, I want to pretend that I'm an original thinker, but what I really am is I'm a student of, of culture and society and I see what's happening in one part and try to apply it differently in another part, right? And that is like, you try to find market inefficiencies or idea inefficiencies to basically kind of make that happen. And so you see that all over the place where, you know, a friend of the show, Alex Lieberman, he saw Shark Tank and was like, hey, I'm going to do the TikTok version of Shark Tank and I'm going to do 60 Second Entrepreneur and I'm going to have people pitch their products in 60 seconds and have everybody on TikTok respond. That's a really original idea, but it is built off of something that is existing and happening in right. the world, right? And so even those original thinkers aren't original. Yeah, I still, I agree with that. I still put that in original thinker, which is see thing can apply it in a new way. I think there is no, like it, there's very few original thoughts in the world, full stop. That is the point I'm making. Yeah. So I think, I, I think in there, maybe what's a better word for original thinkers? I don't know. There's probably a better cat way we should call that category, but the copy and paste marketer takes what you said and just tries to apply it in the same way in the same space. What Alex did was take an idea and apply it in a different way. And I think that is like that top echelon of people. I'll, I'll test a little test a little term on you that I've been been working on for this, for this, that you can determine if it's better than original thing or not. I call it pragmatic creatives. You're a pragmatic creative. You know, the, the artists are artists, right? They're just purely creative. They're just going to make things and some of it's going to work, some of it's going to not, uh, not, but it is truly like their art, their thing. If you're a pragmatic creative, you have some type of goals, some type of constraints, but you're able to apply creativity within those goals and constraints to do something really mm. valuable, right? And I think the best right. creators are really pragmatic creatives at the end of the day. And the other things, so the first traits of creators we just walked through, there's a level of creativity and thought. And what you want is that original thinker, pragmatic creative level. You can actually get fairly far with the copy and paste, you know, but you can't do is get very far at all with the lazy because the lazy is just killed by AI. The other reason yeah. here and, and the other trait that creators have next that I want to talk about is the best creators are ambidextrous, which means they have point of view, they have idea, they have creativity. And they can apply that in any form or medium that they want. And the reason this strategy is so important and interesting is because it enables you to be agile. I want to try something on you, Karen. I, I haven't talked to you about this. This is, this is new. This is hot. I've been talking to some smart people this week and my brain's been moving. And I, I, got, a, I got a new two by two I want to try on, on with you and, and, and see what you think. You ready? Go. It's a very simple two by two. It is, so when we talk about creators, you kind of can't talk about creators without talking about the place they create, whether that be video, podcasts, long form written content, email, what have you, right? Like 
that's just part parcel to the creator strategy. So the two by two I want to share is if you think about all those formats, if you were going to plot them on a two by two where the vertical axis up at the top is high distribution, it's easy to get seen by a lot of people. The bottom is low distribution. It's hard to get seen by a lot of people. And then on the horizontal axis, you have easy to monetize and hard to monetize. And so ideally, if you're a company trying to reduce your cost of customer acquisition, what you're trying to find is invest in the top right quadrant. That is, well, I easy to high distribution, easy to monetize. So I can get in front of a lot of people and I can actually monetize that audience in an effective way for my business. Kieran, what I want to know from you is what would you put in that top right quadrant? What would you say, hey, this is a ch- these are the channels, these are the places that I think are high distribution, high monetization? Because I have two. That's it. I have two. Okay, well, YouTube is definitely on your list, right? YouTube is one of my two. What is the... So I can't put podcasting on that list because... Podcast it's such is a, high monetization, low distribution. It is in the bottom right corner. Low distribution. Quarter. Right. I'm going to put LinkedIn, which you are not going to put, but I'm going to put the LinkedIn. Go- it's the Google search, man. It's Google search. I mean, but you can't be... You can't. Yeah, but for a creator, I'm talking about creators. Oh, but you can write content for Google search if you're a creator. Yeah, I right? guess you can. Yeah, I guess I'm... I'm I, I'm just telling you, if you're a business out there, if you are trying to focus, if you're trying to focus, there's old, it, it, there's nothing else in that top quadrant. Make an argument of anything else you would put in that top right quadrant. High distribution, high monetization. LinkedIn is a fair argument. I could maybe, maybe get there. I think Google is like the... I put that into the category of channels being disrupted, but favorite brands versus creators. Because if you have more resources, more ability to like churn out search content, you know, that actually helps you in that channels where I think having those things doesn't help you in the kind of creator led channel. It doesn't really help. You can have all the resources you want, but not have the talent to go really? grow a big audience in YouTube, grow a big audience on LinkedIn. I 100% agree with that, right? Like name a, you, give me a, give me a brand versus creator. Let them go at Google and search. I put my money on a as long as a brand is a capable brand. Like no one is going to like out HubSpot, HubSpot. No one is going to out Zapier, well, Zapier. Well, so hold, hold on. So, 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 so here, so here is the argument that Kieran's making. I want. I'm gonna. I'm gonna make your argument better than you're making your argument. Okay. So that's that's how nice I am, Kieran. I'm gonna make your argument better than you're capable of making it. Let's go. You're actually making the argument that if you're talking about creators, that creators are best suited when they have a level playing field and don't have a lot of infrastructure investment. So like, for example, what that means, anybody can go and set up a YouTube account for free and everybody starts from the same place. Right. Doesn't matter if you have a billion dollars or zero dollars, you start from the same place, you publish, you create, you build a community and you go, right? What he's making the argument of is the internet and websites and web search is a little different because you have to, First of all, you have to have the money and infrastructure to host and build a a, a website. You have to build credibility and authority to that website. And it's easier to do that if you have more money and more people. You can build links. You can publish content faster. You can arguably maybe publish better content. And so that's a more of an uneven playing field that does favor those that have resources. Is that the argument you're trying to make, Karen? Yeah, I'm making the argument that creators will win when content is the primary thing that is the difference between winning and losing, right? And so where good ideas, personality, points of view, trump the ability to do like technical optimization on websites or all that stuff. So I agree. I think it's like content is the primary factor that determines whether you win or lose. And I, that is not true. I think of Google search, there's a bunch of different things in there. Okay. So let's, let's say we're going to put Google in its own special box for this discussion. Is there anything that goes in that top right quadrant other than YouTube for you? I'm going to put LinkedIn in there. I think LinkedIn okay, is going to be right, a benefit. Fa- this is fascinating. T- uh, tell me why. Elon is going to make a mess of X. People are going to like flock to other channels. No, no. So, all right, you're going to have you you want to have the fucking X discussion Don't now. Don't tell me you think he's going to make he's going to make a good dis- you you think he's going to make X Well, work? first of all, first of all, he's proven the social experiment that network effects matter more than anything else. Because he has done everything, he has done everything possible to try to change it, and people are still kill, using it every day. I use it every day. You use it of every course. day. So how, so how bad is it actually going to be? I don't create half as much on that platform as I used to. I've I'm all in become, on YouTube, baby. I'm I am all in on YouTube, but I still consume a lot on X. YouTube and LinkedIn are my two platforms of choice. I made I made a prediction when 
Elon bought X, that we would look a year from that purchase and then Twitter would be in a better place than it was w- before he bought it. And I stand by that. I hope it's true. I, I would like to see another platform succeed. I think I, it would be better for all of us if X is successful, but I definitely have seen some of the better creators on there get way less in- attention and engagement and some of the worst creators on there who just create things to rile up people get much more attention. And I think that's why I think the people who want to like create content around I- ideas and thoughts and points of view might gravitate to another platform. Then whether I'm right or not, I don't know. But I would like to round out this conversation because we talked about two things that can help you be a, a creator. I want to like have the third one, uh, make sure we we end on the third one. Oh, hold, hold on, before, before we get to the third one, actually, I, I, I want to f- close out on like the whole two by two and the discussion we were having. Two by two. The reason... The reason I, I just brought up that two by two is because channels change, right? And that you have to have agility. And a channel that might be high monetization, high distribution, that might go away a year from now. Or the competition might get right. so bad that distribution isn't as good, right? And so the great thing about a creator-led strategy is that it's very agile. And a creator who is telling interesting stories can do that across any channel. And that's that's the point I was trying to, yeah. to make. I think this is the, like, if you, actually if you have a brand, you can blend together the traditional brand channels and creators, you get the best of both worlds, because I still think it's really hard as a brand to win on these other channels. The third one, I think that the third bucket do, I called original thinkers, you called pragmatic creators. Pragmatic creators, creatives, whatever, it doesn't matter. But yes, yeah. we, we have our own so terms, it's fine. It's I think fine. they are entrepreneurial in spirit. And what do I mean by that? They are, oh, I love they this. test and iterate really fast. The thing I love about content, and I've always loved about content, is the feedback loop is instant, especially on these social platforms. Like, have idea, put idea out there. Does idea get any traction? What worked, what didn't change for the next idea? And you can actually use I- those ideas to ladder up to like create presentation, a book, a whatever it may be. But you can like test chunks of your idea. We've tested parts of what mm-hmm. we're going to cover at Inbound in different formats online. And it gives you such an incredible feedback loop. Going back to like Alex, but he's not the only one, like really good creators. You see him try it. We can, you can see him try everything. And so why are they entrepreneurial in nature? Because you have to be okay with falling flat on your face multiple times in a very public way. Like when you put a video on X or YouTube, or I used to put them on LinkedIn and they get no engagement, right? You feel <laughs> like someone has stabbed you in the heart, right? They're like, oh, geez. Like, <laughs> like no I am one the likes most boring human being ever. <laughs> it's, a, oh. it's a very personal feeling. Like you're putting yourself out there for the world and people are saying, no, like I'm not going to like this. This is not cool. And well, no, it's, that it, is here, it's worse, it's like worse what, than I'm not going to like this. It isn't cool. It's like, I would rather watch videos of dogs running into each other than yeah, anything yeah, then you think is smart to say your in the world, online. right? Which right. is like the most, like the, the apex of humiliation, right? So you have to have that entrepreneurial mindset where you're like, cool, I'll try another thing. I'll try another thing. I'll try another thing. I'll try another thing. And you just continue to grind it. Very few people, I think, out of the gate have just like, crushed content. Now, maybe there's like one or two people, but I suspect even they look like overnight successes before that they have been that overnight success. They've tried content in multiple ways. We talked to Matt Wolf. What was one of the incredible things that he told us? He has been at the YouTube thing since 2016, iterating, trying different things. And it didn't work until he really got into the AI space. And now he is like crushing in that space. Very few people would put themselves their face themselves on a video platform day in, day out, having people just ignore them or having people not pay any attention to them and just getting your soul crushed. And that is why B2B creators, some of the best B2B creators are founders, right? Like Mm -hmm. many of the best B2B creators today are are incredible founders because they actually get the iteration, they get the failure, they get the grind to like success. And I think that's a, one of the characteristics you really have to have to be well, successful. It's not just that. I think you're making a great point, but I, I, I think there's a complementary trait that, that we also need to talk about. They're anti-insular, which basically means like, historically, I think if you've run a company, you've been like, oh, I want my employee completely focused on my business. I don't want them to have any side projects. I don't want to have them to have anything going on. And what normally happens is that's actually counterproductive. Because what they fail to to do is they don't learn, they don't have outside perspective, they don't iterate on ideas fast enough. And like that eventually ends up to just mediocre work. Like if if I want to be really honest, the people that have the best 
ideas and and make the highest impact are anti-insular, which means that they don't insulate themselves in the wall of a company. They just live in the world and they are trying to learn from as many people as possible and iterate on those ideas as fast as possible to learn and then apply that learning, whether it be for a business, for them individually, for both, it doesn't matter. That's what they're trying to do. Agreed. So I think like we have actually given everyone three things that will actually help you to be that B2B creator, or even if you want to incorporate these people into your company, what to look for. Last thing, we should just round out last couple of minutes. What are we telling the company to do? I think I'm telling the company to actually have these people be in your organization, but also have a program where you can work with these people so you get the best of both worlds. I don't think you want to have it completely outsourced where like your podcast and all your social channels are run by external creators. But I think there's some amount of that that is good. That's why we set up the creator program originally in HubSpot. I know it's gone from mm-hmm. strength to strength. But then you want to have a culture where you create these people from the founder top down, which means you have to have the ability as a brand to not care that your people in your company have points of view on social <laughs> or creating things like really True. get an engagement by creating strong points of view, by having side projects. One of the things that HubSpot was actually pretty good at always was allowing people the freedom to have side projects. They actually encouraged it because it helped them learn. And so you have to create a culture where these people can be successful within your company. I think we traditionally have created a culture where we want them to be blend into everyone else. Like they, we want them to sound like everyone else in the company. And that means it's boring, right? Like it's totally boring. Those people yes. are not going to stay in the company. They're not going to work there. They just go and start their own thing. I think a lot of creators just end up going to start their own thing. And so you need to prepare for the world from top down. Like is your founder strong on, so, like, on these channels, has strong point of view, but create that culture where you're going to have people be the voice of your company on these platforms. Kieran, I have a great story that I heard on this topic that I want to share with you. You ready for it? Uh, yes. I was listening to a podcast, and on that podcast, there's a guy named Mike Lombardi. And Mike Lombardi is a longtime NFL coach, executive, like all of those things. And he was telling a story where he worked for Bill Walsh. And Bill Walsh, Kieran, is one of, I, I'm sp- explaining American football to Kieran, everybody watching. Sorry, I'm just going to uh, try to break I, it down. He thinks, the he, he thinks because he's watched he's the quarterback just, documentary on I Netflix and Johnny Manziel, he knows the what's Gators. up. <laughs> Did you watch? The, I went to Swamp. The swamp I'm taking you like, to an SEC football Tebow. game. It's going to I be amazing. Love Te- My new quarterback is Tebow. Uh, oh, is that his name? Oh, Dude is oh. awesome. He, did, he didn't do very well, did he? In the in, no, in no, NFL, he, but... he, he didn't. Okay, but this story is Mike Lombardi was saying he worked for this legendary coach, Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh coached the 49ers when Joe Montana and Steve Young were there, and they won. I forget five Super Bowls or whatever, right? And he was talking about the decision to bring in Steve Young, which was the quarterback that came in after Joe Montana. And he was in his coach's room, which had Mike Holgram, all like basically like everybody who he was asking were to go on to be Hall of Fame people in the NFL. So like brilliant, brilliant people in the NFL, right? And he asked them, each of them, if she if they should bring in Steve Young to replace Joe Montana as their quarterback, Joe Montana's at the end of the end of his career and not playing that well. And all of them said, no, stay with Joe, stay with Joe. And L- Mike Lombardi tells the story of after all that happens, I walk up to Bill Walsh and Bill Walsh says, go pick up Steve Young at the airport. He was like, they're wrong. <laughs> we have to change. We have to evolve. And, and that that consensus opinion leads to bad decisions, right? And that's what we're talking about with your marketing is if your leadership team is obsessed with consensus decision making, you're going to fail. You're going to pay the high cost of customer acquisition tax, right? You're going to have to just do more paid, do the same strategies your competitors are doing and pay more and more for them every year. If you're willing to make individualistic decisions and you're willing to make decisions that are not purely predictable, not purely rational, you will differentiate. Your cost of acquisition will go down. Your growth and your margins will go up. Right. Businesses die because people won't have hard conversations or make hard decisions. Yes. Uh, that that is the lesson here, and that is, and, and this is why CAC is going up. CAC is going up because everybody's scared of doing the same shit. It's also why you get and not actually doing anything original. It's also why some of your most ineffective managers are some of your most loved. <laughs> That's a problem with the like, three sixty <laughs> reviews. It's like, oh, I love that my manager true. because, and then you dig in. It's like that manager sucks. <laughs> That's why you love them so much because they let you do whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, a wise okay. point to end this. this <laughs> Look, I, I thought it was. I thought it was a fun story. I thought it was a good. A good note to end on. We have talked to you a little bit about the cat. Make sure Armageddon. you watch the. 
Watch the Gators. Gators, man. Just so everybody watching understands, Kieran's understanding of American football is the Netflix quarterback documentary, which he thinks Patrick Mahomes is awesome. Smart take. Good take, because Patrick Mahomes is awesome. And then and then Johnny Manziel and Tim Tebow. Like, that's your reflection of American football. Come on, man. Tebow was, man, that, that guy's a competitor. Didn't drink, didn't do anything. He just competed. I love that. And shout out at people. Oh, Kieran. Kieran. He didn't do any, I get this feeling that he, did he, he didn't do anything weird, did he? You're kind of giving me vibes that he might have went no, out and did weird stuff I mean, or something. He's, there's, there's some weird stuff. There, uh, you do some Google searches. Do, 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 some, do some Google searches I know and, and, and understand. The, all I know is the Gator documentary, so don't come at me with like he did weird <laughs> stuff after that. Right? I don't know anything all about right. that. All right, all good, all good. Tebow T- T- is definitely an interesting character. But <laughs> I don't know how we go from creators and CAC to Tim Tebow, but... Welcome. That's marketing against the grain, everybody. That's what we do. <laughs> we go all the way, all the way around. But we're bringing it back. We gave you some practical ways. We gave you the breakdown of creators on today's show. We gave you a blueprint to reduce your CAC long term. We're going to keep talking about this on the show, but this is a great first step. We'll be back very soon with a live from inbound edition of Marketing Against the Grain, and uh, we'll see you then. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot. Grow better. 